Hello everyone, welcome to part three of the Stratasys Rebuild project. In this video, I'm going to be tackling the z-axis. If you remember from the end of the last video when I got um, everything kind of moving around, I noticed that there is a lot of play in the z-axis. So in this video, I'm going to take that apart, figure out what's going on, rebuild it, and hopefully get that working so I can move on to the smoothie board, the heaters, the extruders, and finally getting the thing printing. The first thing I needed to do was actually remove the whole z-axis assembly. I tried just kind of removing the table and doing some other things, but eventually I went and referenced the service manual that I found, and um, I'll put a link to that in the description below. But looking at the service manual, you really have to do quite a bit of work to get this out. Um, it's basically underneath the machine, you unscrew the rods, you unscrew the motor assembly, and then you take one of the pulleys off of the actual screw rod, and then up top, you need to remove the screws from the top of the rods and the top of the screw rod assembly, and then the whole thing just kind of lifts out. So it took a little bit to get it out, but honestly, the instructions in the service manual were really straightforward and helped out a lot. And it was maybe only about 15 minutes to get this whole assembly out of the machine. Here's what the Z stage looks like when it's removed from the machine. The particular version that I have has just the one threaded rod in the middle and then the two smooth rods on the outside. There's a couple different versions out there, but this is the one that I have. As you can see, the smooth rods have an excessive amount of play, and that's because the bearings are completely shot. Just to make things a little easier to work on, I decided to completely disassemble everything and take off that um, top table or um, top platform that the um, build platform sits on top of. And that was just a matter of um, taking off a couple screws and then that left me with the bearing block assembly. The service manual specifically talks about how if you're going to remove the rod from this bearing assembly, that you need to have some kind of spacer inside or else the um, ball bearings are going to go everywhere. So it's not a fully contained bearing that was in there. I, of course, didn't care because the bearings were shot anyway. And uh, when I removed the rods, you could see just how disintegrated and torn up the bearings were. I mean, they just came out in little pieces. So yeah, the bearings were completely shot and I just needed to um, scrape everything out of there and get all the remnants of the old bearings out. Here is the bearing block with everything removed. Now, I know that the linear bearings need to be replaced, but what about the lead screw and the nut on the lead screw? You might have seen when I was uh, messing with this when I tore it apart that I was kind of wiggling it back and forth, and there is actually a substantial amount of play in the lead screw, but that's okay. So why is that okay? Well, the lead screw has no play up and down. There's absolutely nothing up and down, but it actually does have a lot of wobble left and right. So if these two rods are doing their job, they're going to keep this bearing block perfectly stationary like this, so it's not gonna move this way or this way. That is the job of these two and the two rails over here. So the only thing that this will do is move up and down. These can move freely up and down, but this, cannot move up and down. The um, wobble that you see here is a function of the um, misalignment design of this. You can see that I can slide this top piece back and forth quite a bit, and like that, this is actually just a separate piece that comes off like that. And then there is a slot here that corresponds on the bottom of this. So it's just a misalignment tool that this can actually slide this way and that way, perfectly perpendicular to that axis. And as long as this doesn't have any wobble this way or this way, everything should be fine. So I'm gonna keep this assembly. This is all perfectly fine. I lucked out a little bit with the bearings on this. I measured the inside bore and also measured the um, size of the rod here. The rod is a 5 8 inch and the inner bore is a 1 and 1 8 and I found these bearings on eBay for pretty cheap. These were 10 bucks a piece, so $40 for all four of them shipped, and these drop right in. 
So um, these are just a simple linear bearing. I actually found this model on VXB.com as well as McMaster Car. It's a relatively common um, bearing. I just end up getting them a little cheaper on eBay. And these just fit directly into the bore, one on that side, one on that side. And then the rod will just slide right through. Now, we're almost done here. This has a tiny bit of play, and I'm gonna talk about how I'm gonna get rid of that later. It's really not much. It's just maybe a thousandth, if that. The next thing I need to do is figure out how to actually fit these in here and keep them in here. Typically bearings like this are meant to go inside a bore and then you have some sort of um, slot on the inside of that bore and then there's a snap ring that holds them from coming out. This particular bearing block has a couple um, posts that are set inside here and there and they keep the bearings from going all the way in. So you can see it's kind of stopping right there. So that's good. I just need something to keep them from coming out like that. So what I'm gonna do instead of um, installing a snap ring or anything like that, I'm just gonna drill four holes along this channel and those will correspond to these little ridges that are on the bearing. And I'm just gonna do a couple of grub screws just to press against that little ridge and keep them from popping out. The first thing I need to do for that is widen this little ridge. I'm gonna use a 440 grub screw and this ridge just isn't quite wide enough, so if I tighten the grub screw down, it might crush on these outer edges, and I really don't wanna do that. I don't wanna put any pressure on this bearing. I just wanna keep it from sliding this way. So I'm gonna slap these on the lathe and widen that little groove just wide enough so that a 440 grub screw can press against it. Then I'm gonna drill these four holes, and then I'm gonna install everything back in the machine. Widening the little slots on the bearings was pretty straightforward. I just took a little piece of tape and wrapped it on the opposite end of the bearing, just so that when I clamped it in the jaws, it wouldn't scratch the plastic or damage anything on the outside of the bearing. And then, you know, it was just a matter of um, putting the tool in the middle of the slot, going a little bit to the left, going a little bit to the right, checking it against the grub screw, and rinsing and repeating for all the bearings. Getting the bearing block mounted on the Tormach really wasn't too big of a deal. I just made sure to stand right in front of the camera. That seemed to help quite a bit. I just used a couple one, two, three blocks on either side, clamped it down, and then just kind of did a sweep across the front just to make sure it was parallel. I wasn't really too concerned with it being really parallel because I was gonna go and indicate everything anyway, but eh, why not? I used the passive probe on the mill to ultimately find the hole locations. There's this channel that runs on the same plane as the bore for the bearings. So I used the probe to find the center line of that and that's where all the holes would go. Once I found that, then I would indicate off the front face and I had some calculations I wrote down in my notebook and that would give me the hole locations. So that was pretty straightforward and I would use the probe to find it for the front and then reprobe on the back to find the locations on the back. The only thing I ran into was in drilling the holes on the back, part of the casting was in the way of where I wanted to put those holes. So I just grabbed an end mill and just kind of shaved off a little bit just to give me room for that uh, screw to fit in place. The only thing left to do before I install the bearings into the bearing block is to tap these eight holes. One little note about tapping holes. Do not do this at 9.30 at night when you're really tired and have been working on this project all day because you will break a tap like I did. I had completely forgotten how fragile a 440 tap is. I was going too fast, I wasn't paying attention, I ended up breaking a tap, but it really wasn't the end of the world. For that bearing, I'm just gonna have the one set screw instead of two, it should be fine. So here is the completed bearing block. Earlier, I talked about how there was a little bit of play in the bearings and how I was gonna fix that. Well, let's look at this. So here we've got one rod over here, and over here, we have another one. And as you can see, they're very different. I can almost not spin this one. This one spins freely. 
I'm trying to get a little bit of play in here and there isn't any. And here, you can hear that there's a little bit of wiggle room this way. So um, let me show you what I did to get rid of this excess play in this one over here. So here we have the four bearings. These have been unmodified, whereas these have a very small modification to them. On these bearings, you can see right here and here, I have two pieces of tape on both of these. These bearings are made to compensate for angular mismatch. Um, they're called self-aligning bearings. And these little pieces of metal here actually move in and out with the bearings. So if I press on the bearings, you can see it pop up and then I can push it back down. So the idea is when the rod goes through the bearing, all five of these little pieces actually expand out like this. And if I was to compress all of these really tightly, the rod actually barely goes in there and it's actually very tight and as soon as I let go it's nice and loose. So what's happening is the bore on the bearing block is ever so slightly too large just by a tiny bit. So I'm using this aluminum tape and I've cut off just a couple of pieces and stuck them to a couple of these um, little metal pieces so that they can't expand as much as they should. And I played around with this a little bit. I did four on one of these and it kind of bound up a little bit and I kind of backed it down and I found that two was perfect. If I do two, there's absolutely no play whatsoever in that rod, but it also moves in and out freely. And you can see just from that demonstration earlier that without, in, without any of that tape, these just move way too freely and there's a little bit of extra slop in there. But with um, two little pieces of tape, just one there and one there, everything is nice and tight and there is absolutely no detectable play whatsoever. Now it's time to put everything back together. I used the bearings that already had the tape, put those into the bearing block and then just lubed everything up. I'm using this K Luber um, bearing grease that I had left over from my CNC build that I did a little while ago. And I just spread some on the inside of the bearings as well as the outside of the rod and just kind of ran it through a few times just to give it a little bit of lubrication. And um, after that was done, I just went on to the other set of bearings, added the tape onto those, lubricated those as well. The threaded rod already had some grease on it, um, but I hooked it up to my drill and just ran the nut through just a few times, really just to evenly distribute the grease along the rod. There was a big clump kind of at the top, the middle really didn't have any, so I just kind of ran it through a few times just to evenly distribute that grease throughout the rod. Now that everything's reassembled, it's just a matter of putting it back into the machine. I followed the instructions basically in reverse on how I got it out and put it back in, uh, fiddling with the lead screws and the nicely very greased rods was kind of tricky because everything was very slippery and hard to kind of get in there. But once I got it positioned inside the machine, I just tightened some of the screws from the top to kind of hold it in place temporarily, then crawled underneath the machine and tightened everything from below then went back through and tightened everything finally. It really wasn't that bad. It probably only took, you know, 15 minutes or so fiddling with it. And um, yeah, went in really easy. The Z-axis is back installed in the machine and it is solid. When I put this back in, the first thing I did was grab it and try and shake it. And I thought, oh no, it's locked in place, it's bound up. But nope, I um, spun the lead screw around a few times and it is perfectly fluid. It feels really smooth. It is just completely solid in there. So that's a big win. The bearings did the trick. Everything looks good. Unfortunately, this was kind of diversion away from everything else on the project, but these things happen. So I'm just waiting for the smoothie board to show up. And as soon as that shows up, I'm gonna go and connect the gecko drive to the smoothie board, start getting the heaters going, and start getting the smoothie board controlling all the motors. See you then.